All right, hello everybody and welcome back to the main room. Now is the part in the presentation where we're going to um, have a discussion with our feature panel, uh, which is going to be moderated by Veronica Eady, the Deputy Executive uh, for Environmental Justice and Policy at the Bay Area Air Quality Management District. And she's going to be leading an amazing conversation with nationally recognized environmental justice leaders. Um, the first is Mustafa Ali, who is the Vice President for Environmental Justice, Climate and Community Revitalization with the National Wildlife Federation, as well as Angelo Logan, who is the Campaign Director for the Moving Forward Network, and also the co-founder of ECRs for Environmental Justice in East Los Angeles. And then finally, we have Bernice Miller-Travis, who's the Executive Vice President for Environment and Sustainability with a metropolitan group and also the co-founder of the West Harlem Environmental Action Coalition, one of the oldest uh, standing environmental justice organizations in the country. So with that, let me turn it over to Veronica Eady. Veronica, whenever you're ready. Sure, thanks, sure. Kevin. Um, are you all hearing an echo? Am I okay? Okay, I'm assuming that that's a yes. Uh, so, this is really amazing, and I just want to thank you, Kevin, and the other organizers of this effort. Um, I was saying to somebody that your introductory remarks were really triggering my own Black trauma and um, how important it is to be triggered by my own trauma so that I can begin to process it. And everything that's happened over the last couple of years with the murder of George Floyd and the, the uprising um, against... Um, uh, racial um, racism um, has been a process for me finally dealing with um, all of these things that I've buried so that, that I could keep my head down and, and work in the trenches. And so now is the time to be in this uncomfortable position for so many um, government workers and others um, and uncomfortable position for me as a person of color. We're, we're processing and we're making progress. So I do wanna thank um, um, the organizers of this day. So I get the uh, great joy of being on this panel with three amazing people. Um, Kevin, I appreciate the introductions. Um, I'll just say a little bit more. And, and when we get started, I want you all to talk about yourselves um, as well. Um, Vernice Miller-Travis, I consider a, a mentor and friend, and she adopted me um, more than 25 years ago when I first got started in the EJ movement. Um, as Kevin pointed out, she was one of the co-founders of West Harlem. Uh, well, we act for environmental justice, it's now called, um, and Bernice has continued to be active um, with that organization on its board. I met her years ago when she was at NRDC, um, founding the EJ program there. So um, happy to be there with Bernice. And uh, Mr. Mustafa Santiago Ali, um, I met you back when you were in your 20s, uh, starting your career at uh, US EPA. And since leaving that um, uh, position at EPA um, a few years ago in the Trump administration, um, in an open letter to Scott Pruitt, the then administrator, uh, your work has just skyrocketed and you've played such an important role in the movement. So I'm excited to hear from you. Um, as an influencer and a thought leader. And then finally, I have here um, Angelo Logan. And I've gotten to know Angelo since uh, moving back out to California um, from years of globetrotting. Um, Angelo um, was um, years ago with a um, leading a group called um, East York Communities for Environmental Justice uh, before moving on to the Moving Forward Network. Um, the Moving Forward Network looks at um, freight communities um, uh, across the country. I don't want to call it goods movement. I learned that the word goods, uh, there's not a lot of good in that. Uh, we are huge consumers in the United States um, and 40% of those goods that we're ordering, particularly from um, overseas come through the ports of LA and Los Angeles um, and then are put onto trucks um, on highways like Highway 710 in the LA region. Highway 880 in the Bay Area region. These are freeways that um, are designated for trucks while um, um, wealthier white communities have freeways where trucks are not allowed. So we're battling that um, in the Bay Area right now. 
Um, just uh, keep in mind though, that as we're clicking on Amazon and where else, wherever else we're ordering from, uh, we are putting a burden on communities of color and low-income communities. Um, so I will stop with the introduction. Um, I have a few questions for you all today and um, I would love to just have kind of an organic conversation. So feel free to um, jump in if I'm not calling on you and, and say what you're feeling. Um, we had a really good foundation this morning on um, redlining and zoning. Urban renewal is another factor um, in uh, how we've gotten to where we are today. Um, we have a human problem that was created by government. Um, so I wanna to talk today about um, what we need to be doing, how we can support the EJ movement, how we as um, responsible um, leaders in government can um, change the course and change our strategy. So um, let me just ask you uh, your thoughts on um, how we got here. Um, how did we get to this, um, this overburdening and this, um, outright environmental racism in so many communities across the United States. Um, to get the, I, I do want you all to jump in, but I'm gonna start with um, Vernice to kick it off. And I look forward to hearing um, all of your thoughts on this. Thank you, Veronica, so very much. Um, and I wanna say um, a special thank you to Michelle Pierce. I was in the session that Michelle presented on from Bayview Hunters Point. Um, a community that I spent a lot of time in way, way, way back in the day in 1979, um, the summer after my junior year of college in New York, I came out to uh, San Francisco to visit my uncle, my uncle Wally, who had been a member of the Black Panther Party, but by then was the, the registrar at Golden Gate University Law School. And I worked for him that summer and I was introduced to some friends of his, uh, the Watkins family who lived in Bayview Hunters Point and um, spent a lot of time there. And this was before I had um, I had determined that the, the course of my work, my life's work was gonna be um, fighting environmental racism and fighting for environmental justice. And you know, who knew? I did not, I did not know that um, Bayview Hunters Point was sort of ground zero in the Bay Area. Um, and I just really appreciated Michelle's comments, her historic look back and she touched on a number of things, but one of the things she touched on is um, the pattern of, of race-based residential segregation. And I'm an urban planner. And so for me, all lines, Veronica, lead back to the system of formal land use planning. It is the foundation of environmental racism. It is the foundation of race-based residential segregation. It is the foundation of exclusionary zoning. I'm imagining Charles talked about a lot of this in, in his presentation, but all uh, paths lead back to this particular sphere, which is an, an interconnected sort of uh, race-based process that is driven by both local government, state government, and the federal government. And so you ask, you know, how did we get here? We got here from um, a process and a set of values that were held by local, state, and federal government that said that people of color were inherently unequal and inherently less valued as human beings, that the quality of our life, the, the places where we lived, the air we breathe, the, the, the conditions of the housing we lived in, the things we lived next to um, or adjacent to, the schools that our children went to, the recreational spaces or lack thereof um, that we had to enjoy were so much less than or non-existent. All of that was a matter of government policy and practice and function that all started and ended and continues today through the zoning process. And so, you know, because I am a planner, obviously that's one of the lenses that I see things through, but I would just say to folks that the reason that I'm a planner, Veronica mentioned the organization that I'm the co-founder of, We Act for Environmental Justice. We're celebrating our 34th anniversary um, next month, October, but we've really been around for almost four years because we did a lot of community organizing before we started the nonprofit. Um, when I looked at my own community in New York and Harlem, and I tried to, to make sense of how come 
the white community that was just south of us, the Morningside Heights community where Columbia University is, how come their sidewalks weren't all torn up? How come they had parks with lots of trees in them? How come they had all kinds of grocery stores? They were adjacent to us. You could just walk down Broadway and you'd get to their community once you cross the 125th Street. But the difference between our two communities was so marked. And then I started paying attention to what was happening across New York City and all the communities that I spent time in, where the black people were, where the brown people were, where the Asian people were, were always of less quality. Um, we had problems with sanitation. We had problems with housing code enforcement. We had problems with highways and byways going through our communities. And it created a real serious um, public health challenge for us. And so I'll, I'll end it with this, Veronica. You asked, what could we do? We have been raising hell in our community about the construction of a giant sewage treatment plan on our waterfront, on our western waterfront on the Hudson River. And we raised a lot of saying, we did a lot of research. Um, Miss Margaret, I know you're in the audience and I just wanna lift up the power of West Oakland Indicators uh, project and the power of data and data collection to drive and change a narrative. And as we were collecting data in our own community, we found that we had the highest rate of particulate pollution of any community in the United States, the highest incidence of asthma of any community in the United States and the highest uh, rate of premature death from asthma of any community in the United States. And that's when we realized that we were really up against it. We didn't know how bad we had it until we started to collect this data with partners, right? And one day we went to a, a public meeting, Veronica, um, at Columbia Law School that was hosted by, um, it was a meeting with the commissioner of the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. And he and his agency, along with the city of New York, along with the state of New York, along with EPA Region 2, had just consistently dismissed the, the tragic circumstances that were unfolding in our community that were environment and zoning based. And so he said in a speech, we really need to recognize and acknowledge that what has happened to the West Harlem community is no fault of theirs. And it's perhaps one of the most egregious examples of environmental racism in the state of New York. And I swear to you, I could have gone running up and down that aisle like I was in church at a revival because I just needed to hear some public official recognize and say out loud that what happened to us was not our fault, that it was intentional racism that put us in the predicament that we were in and that we were dying at a disproportionate rate because people dismissed and did not acknowledge the value of our lives. Um, and that's what brought me to this work. And that's what keeps me at this work because that fight goes on in Harlem. Thank you, Bernice. Uh, I wasn't gonna call on you, but I see uh, Mustafa that you are unmuted. <laughs> and we're gonna get you in here too, Angelo. Well, I mean, I agree with everything Bernice says. I take it a little bit further back. You know, what we are seeing when we see redlining, restrictive covenances and zoning is the fruit of a poison tree. So we gotta actually go to the roots to really understand what's going on. Of course, that's systemic racism. And we often fail to highlight for folks um, how systemic racism has been a part of the system since the founding of this country. You know, we'll, we'll pay attention right now to the United States and then we'll zoom in on California. So we know that it was policy that was driven by racism that actually gave credence to the removal of indigenous brothers and sisters from their traditional land, taking them away from their traditional foods, and even gave um, the right to be able to uh, place genocidal types of actions on our indigenous brothers and sisters. And we often don't call that out. Folks knew the blankets they were given folks had smallpox on it and other diseases that would eradicate our brothers and sisters. That is a part of the systemic racism that has poisoned the tree. We know that it was policy that said that you could go to Africa and enslave brothers and sisters and bring them here for free labor, give them the most dangerous jobs to do, uh, and then of course place them in the least desirable locations on the plantations. Does it sound familiar? to some of the things that are still going on today with redlining and restrictive covenances and those of us who work on worker justice related issues. Our Chinese brothers brought here for cheap labor to build our transportation system, our railroads, 
And then to be told that through the Chinese Exclusion Acts that you needed to go back home, that you were no longer needed, that you were definitely going to be marginalized. Our Japanese brothers and sisters placed in internment camps and being able to take their property away from them. This is a part of the history of our country that is driven by policy and the racism that exists inside of it. And of course, our Latinx brothers and sisters have had to face things with school segregations, with lynchings. We often talk about African-American brothers and sisters being lynched, but it was also a part of the reality for Latinx brothers and sisters. And then we have to also talk about the mass deportations that have gone on in this country in relationship to Latinx brothers and sisters and others in the 1860s and 70s, but the huge amount of deportation that happened in the 1920s and 30s as the stock market began to crash and then people needed to have a scapegoat. So they said, well, it must be those Mexican workers who are taking away our jobs and lowering our lifestyles. This is all a part of the systemic racism that has been built into policy and transportation in the environment and housing and jobs in the medical field, so forth and so on, that gave justification for many of the actions that we saw in the 40s, 50s and 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s, and even today that we are trying to unpack and dismantle. So for me, that is the history. You gotta go back to the roots to understand this fruit that is now being um, born over the last 40 or 50 years. Thanks, Mustafa. Those are some powerful uh, words. Angelo? Yeah, thank, thank you. And, and uh, what an honor to be on this panel with such amazing people. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I knew this was going to happen, that, that the words of Bernice and Mustafa were going to be um, so bright and filling that you know, I have very little to add, at least on this particular topic. But I'll just um, echo some of what you all have said, and that is that, that what we're dealing with today is really a, a manifestation and a legacy of that heinous act of stolen people on stolen land, right? Uh, the, the, the legacy of racism in our country and in and, and many places beyond the United States as well. Um, you, you know, this is really a progression of, of those racist acts and, and um, assaults in our communities and our people um, from Jim Crow to redlining to um, these uh, policies and and programs that allow for the siting of toxic facilities for cumulative impacts on our communities, communities of color that um, have very few tools to protect their communities. So this is really, um, as Mustafa and Bernice mentioned, it's really a legacy of systemic racism, but that we need to really make sure that we are not seeing this as something that's um, historic or something that's uh, just part of our history, but it's uh, something that is present today and um, is relevant in the actions that we take every single day. I also just wanted to say that um, we often paint the picture of our communities as being um, brutally oppressed in so many different forms, and that's true, but we need to recognize that our communities, our people are beautiful places as well, and that we're not just resilient that um, we create beautiful places that make it um, worth fighting for our communities to protect our communities. So although there's lots of assaults on our communities, um, our communities um, are beautiful places as well. And as, some, uh, as a, one of a, a friends of mine, an artist that has a, a series of photos um, named this, this series, um, Roses Fly, where, I mean, sorry, Roses Grow Where Bullets Fly. Um, in other words, to say that in the midst of some of the most um, brutal environments, there is beauty. And so I just want to make sure that we're not just, um, that, that we're leaning into that. That's the reason that we're fighting for our community. Angela, I have to write that down. Roses grow where bullets uh, fly. That's really powerful. Um, and I appreciate that. Um, you know, I've spent a good deal of my career as a government policymaker, and I'm, I'm in that role right now. Um, and we've been, yeah, I don't want to say we were always good at it, but we're getting better at showing up for meetings and um, community meetings. And that's an important piece of it. But since we played, we government policymakers played the you know prominent role in getting us into the situation where we are right now um it's time for us to go beyond showing up you know uh 
I, I've talked a lot um, over the last few years about um, power sharing with local communities. And uh, I was on a, a, a webinar um, about a month ago with a, an activist at Leadership Council for um, Justice and Accountability, Veronica Garibay. And uh, Veronica talked about, she, she raised it, the, the bar a little bit higher beyond going and sharing power we have a new word, co-powerment. Um, so we as government, uh, government people in the bureaucracy, bureaucracy need to start to seed power, um, follow the direction of communities and co-power together. So my next question for you is, what are some of the solutions? You know, how you know, we talk about making room for people at the table and we, we need to do more than that. And so I'm looking for uh, some of your guidance and how we uh, take that next step. Bernice, I see you're unmuted. <laughs> so I, I like that, that notion, Veronica, of co-powerment. I, I would say, you know, a couple things. It's a re-examination and a re-evaluation of what we mean by government. We say government by the people, for the people, but what we mean is government by some white people, for some white people, right? And not all white people, um, but just the land and gentry, as it were, the more affluent. In the Bay Area, it would be the, you know, it would be the, um, the uh, Silicon Valley types who are, you know, changing everything, including housing patterns, housing costs, transportation costs, everything, but it's all sort of forming to suit that particular population as opposed to everyone who lives in the Bay Area. Um, we need to rethink what we mean by government, right? Yes, government is representational, but who are you representing? And if we're all paying taxes, and we are all paying taxes, then how do we go back to or go forward to a notion of democracy that is really about representational public policy? representational decision making. So we're we're functioning in a system as Mustafa said and and um as Angelo said that is rooted in exclusionary policies, discrimination, race-based practices. And so all we've done is bring successive generations into a, a truly um a, a, a truly dysfunctional system. And now we think that we can just put different people in the system and then make it functional. You have to unpack, undo, re-examine, rebuild, reconstruct what was fundamentally a racist system. And we can start with local government and then we can build on state government and then we can build on federal government. And I, I believe, Veronica, I, um, you know, I'm way back east uh, in, in the DMV in DC, Maryland, Virginia, but every day I am so proud of the fact that Veronica is doing what she's doing. Um, and is moving in the space that she's moving in because that means that different perspectives come into the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, different values are seated, different people are hired to do different things, to look at their job and, and their mission in a different way. You gotta rethink the process. And sometimes rethinking the process means breaking it down and building it back. That's true for the federal government. That's true for state government. That's true for local government. So. I know some people say that just changing people doesn't make a difference, but I'm here to tell you when Mustafa Ali was part of the senior leadership structure, the Environmental Protection Agency, you better believe it made a huge difference, a huge difference. And so I think we need different people. I, I think we need different perspectives, but I think we need a fundamentally different interpretation of what is the role of government and who does it serve? Uh, uh, Angelo, you want to go? So, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead and we'll stop. I'll follow you. <laughs> so I agree with Bernice. There needs to be a paradigm shift. And I've given a lot of thought to this. Um, and I've been blessed to, to work at different levels with different folks. Um, so one of the things we can do is change the paradigm. So with our advisory boards, we often talk about advice and recommendations without there also being accountability. You know, those boards uh, should be able to hold people accountable. So Mustafa, what does that look like? I've been thinking a lot about this. We need to actually make sure that there is a scorecard for each 
federal agency and state agency that is tied to resources. It's just like when you're on your job. If you're not successful at moving the needle at your job, then you may lose your job, of course, and that's why voting is so important. But the other side of this is that you're also not going to get a bonus or any of the other incentives that are supposed to be a part of. So we need to be able to better tie uh, the resources um, to the folks who are making decisions. Now, you got to drill a little bit further down on this, and, and I tried to get this to become a reality before I'm hoping underneath of this administration it will be, uh, and then that it will make its way to state and county and local uh, agencies and departments as well. The other thing you got to do is you've got to build environmental justice into the performance standards of the folks who work inside of these spaces and places. If you don't, environmental justice, the veneer of environmental justice will be heralded and, and people will use it and utilize it, but the work will never be fully done. Um, and I, I promise you that if that becomes a reality, then environmental justice will truly become a priority because people are actually being evaluated on it. That's one of the ways that you change this dynamic um, that, that goes on, uh, along with a number of other things that I know Angelo is about to drop on folks. Thank you, Mustafa. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't really, I, I'm just gonna like throw out ideas as we're having this conversation, but one of the thoughts that comes to, to me is, is what is the function uh, of government and government agencies? You know, the government agencies that we depend on to protect um, our community's health. Um, is it the, the function that um, historically some of these agencies and governments plays in upholding redlining and other um, rules, regulations, and laws that perpetuate um, racism, right? This is part of the systemic racism that we're talking about that um, we need to really challenge. You know, what is the real role of these particular um, laws, rules, and regulations, and who's positioned to take advantage of that of those um, those policies, um, you need to have a lot of resources, a lot of information, and a lot of um, willpower and motivation. And in a lot of cases, you know, this capitalistic system with big corporations are well positioned to take advantage of the rules that exist today. Today, that even um, we see as um, regulations or policies that are supposed to be for the benefit of EJ communities. You know, who's actually taking advantage of those resources, for instance. Um, and so I really need to think about, you know, who and what does um, government and specifically um, agencies, you know, serve? Who do they really serve and what to what benefit and, and to um, what end? I would also say, I, I think that we need to really think about and challenge um, this idea that we're not responsible for the actions that happened um, you know, prior in history around redlining and other types of policies. There's things that are happening today that we cannot be bystanders uh, and, and watch and spectate and not take action knowing that those particular policies will continue to perpetuate uh, environmental racism, that we need to um, stand up and not just be witness to, but take action and um, not hold water, not carry water for um, what we, clearly know in some cases are at the benefit of the oppressor rather than the oppressed, the communities that we are supposed to be um, upholding and, and protecting. That um, standing by and holding water on policies that just delay action, that just continue to push the can down the road. Um, it's the saying, you know, justice delayed is justice denied. And if we know that's the case, then we're just as guilty as our forefathers that have taken racist actions. And so I want to challenge that, that we stand up and we, we um, take those brave actions um, and, and really push the envelope and agencies, organizations, and, um, and institutions are made up of individuals, right? So as individuals, we can take action and, and change the course of these large shifts. And just lastly, if I can just say that um, at the end of the day, we're talking about environmental justice, but we need to make sure that we're not leaving out the communities that are doing this work, right? The folks that are on the ground every day that are working diligently to protect their communities and their families and their, and their folks. 
um, but that it's not up to agencies to determine these particular types of um, outcomes. It's the communities, and one of the cornerstones of environmental justice is self-determination. And so how do we support those types of programs, rules, regulations, and laws that allow for folks to determine for themselves what their communities should look like? Angelo, before I move off from you, can you just talk a little bit about um, a little bit more about the communities and the role that uh, community organizing has played in in your work? Well, I would say that that's the, the core of the work, right? Is that um, nothing moves, nothing happens without community organizing. It's all about folks in communities building power, because when we look at the systems that were um, set up to basically hold us in positions of, of, um, of oppression. Um, those were set up for folks to be able to um, allow them to gain wealth, capital, and power. So we're up against this um, system that um, you know, requires us to gain that, that some type of power to defeat um, those forms of oppression. Um, and so organizing is just that, building community power, um, building um, uh, coalescing folks in communities so that we can transform those communities, not not transition them, not not displace them, that, but to really invest in a ra radical way um, so that folks in their communities can have the communities that they really um, want to see. Um, so again, community organizing, community building is at the core. Without that, nothing changes, nothing, nothing works. Um. So I want to uh, continue and kind of maybe dig a little bit deeper into what some of the solutions are. And y'all have had some really good ideas. Um, you know, I am really interested and I don't want to limit your response to this, but I'm very interested in the, the um, topics of um, reparations, um, reinvesting in communities of color. There have been a couple of um, well, there's actually been quite a lot of um, discussion about reparations. Um, about a month ago or two months ago in Commonwealth Magazine, which is a, a Massachusetts, a Boston magazine, there was um, some friends of mine uh, did an opinion piece on um, reparations in Boston. Um, so I wanna lift up my friend, Ajamu Brown. I don't think he's on today, but he was one of the authors as well as James Jennings, who is a retired professor from Tufts University. Um, the Brookings Institution, I think about a year ago, put out a piece on it by Rashawn Ray and Andre Perry. Um, we've heard about it, you know, uh, in uh, observing the um, anniversary of uh, the burning of Black Wall Street. Um, where do uh, reparations or are there other, some other types of investment that we need to be doing? How do we um, support um, indigenous communities that, you know, where genocide was focused um, and Mustafa, you talked about the, the smallpox blankets. How do we, where do we go? How do we get these things moving? If I can jump in and I'll be quick, but yeah. I, I think reparations and returning of, of the land is an, is an important element to the work that we need to, to um, push and to advocate for. Um, you know, the, the reparations and radical investment in communities is critical and important, but not alone, right? We need to really make sure that we are establishing uh, mandatory rules and regulations that truly protect communities coupled with um, reparations and radical investment in communities um, can help to transform and allow for communities to determine of their communities rather than uh, you know, corporations, developers, or other folks come in. So again, reparations, returning to the land, radical investment, and mandatory rules and regulations and laws that um, give us a leg up in our communities. Here, here. My old boss, uh, in the 24 years of federal service, two years was on Capitol Hill. I was working for John Conyers, uh, who actually was the first to introduce a uh, reparations bill. So, you know, the, the first part is getting um, all of our folks together to be able to think through what does reparations truly look like, you know, outside of the bubble in Washington, D.C., uh, of, of some of the decision makers who are there. 
There have been conversations uh, about some of the staples that we know are incredibly important in helping our people to be able to be uplifted. Uh, one of them, of course, is education. How are we gonna create real intentionality in the education system to make sure that the resources are there uh, for folks? Uh, another part is housing, because we know housing is a part of building wealth um, uh, and being able to pass it on generationally. You know, another part of it is around business. We often talk about uh, getting people prepared to be workers in a space, which is a critically important, but it is also critically important for us to have our own ownership of our own businesses because we know we are much more likely to hire uh, folks inside of our communities. There are a number of things that go into the conversation around and the sets of actions, you know, around what this might look like. But for me, it starts with intentionality. You know, we can already begin to, to make sure that we're making real investments inside of our communities. The problem is, is that many of our laws and statutes and regulations um, stop that from those dollars to actually being able to make it into our communities. And we often don't talk about that. So we set these expectations for brothers and sisters that these resources are actually going to make it to the spaces and places that need them the most. And we have these impediments that are built into policy, that are built into the legislation. And we have the hard work of being able to actually dismantle uh, many of these pieces of legislation that we lean on that were never meant to help our communities to be whole. So for me, that is also a part of this broader conversation that we have to move forward on in this moment. So building on what my, what my colleagues and, and friends have said, I think the reparations issue is critically important because I think without that, you continue to perpetuate generational trauma. And we are still living in and experiencing generation after generation generational trauma from the things that we have lost. And so I learned something um, really important in the breakout session that I was in, which was the session that um, that Michelle Pierce led for Bayview Hunters Point. And LaDonna Williams spoke up um, and shared that the, the way that the Fillmore District became a Black community was that the Japanese Americans that were interred and whose properties were stripped from them and whose lands and businesses were stripped from them it was then sold uh, or allowed to be sold or rented to black folks in um, in the Fillmore district because it was felt that that community was dirty because it had been it had been a pet part of Jap Japantown. I did not know that. Um, and so there's generational trauma on top of generational trauma. And now the Fillmore doesn't really exist. There's a Fillmore Avenue or Fillmore Street, but the community doesn't exist anymore, either as a Japanese community or as a black community. But those people are still carrying that trauma with them, right? And the generations who succeeded from the people who did own property there are carrying that trauma around with them. And so reparations also has to be about restoration, right? Restoration of the damage that people have suffered from the things that they have lost. And then for me, there's another part of reparations that's about ecological restoration, right? So I serve on a board of an organization based in North Carolina, the Land Loss Prevention Project led by Savvy Horn. And what land loss is, is essentially legal services for small farmers so that they can hold on to their land, mostly black farmers, but not entirely black farmers. But the, the issue around loss of land is really critical. And how do we restore people's tenure and security for the land that they've lost that transmits that generational trauma when people lose that land and lose that property but even if you lived in an urban corridor restoration of the ecology that you've lost the trees that were cut down the oak savannas that were taken out of our communities the grasslands that were taken out of our communities the access to water or having access to clean potable drinking water and recreational sources of water the ability to fish the ability to hunt. These are not things that we think about in the urban community, but yet they are important things in terms of people being able to restore their relationship to nature and their relationship to that which we once owned and we once controlled in this country and in other places. But I think when we talk about reparations, we have to talk about restoration, both psychological restoration and ecological restoration, right? And that's part of making our communities whole again. Sorry, trying to unmute myself. 
Um, thank you, Bernice. Uh, we have a few more minutes. Um, I, I want to make sure that folks are uh, keeping up with the chat box. Um, Esther Goolsby, LaDonna Williams, there are some really um, uh, great comments in here. So um, thank you. In the last um, three minutes that we have, um, do you all have any closing comments you want to um, lift up? And then uh, I'm going to hand it off um, at the end to my colleague, Azubuke Akaba. Um, quick fire, last thoughts. Angela? If I could just, yeah. thank you. If, if I could just say uh, something very specific, right? We talked about community power, self-determination and laws, rules and policies that kind of just kicked the can, can down the road. road. Um, I just want to challenge folks that are in agencies and that have a role to play um, related to AB 617 and to the community emission reduction plan. This is a very specific um, call out to challenge you all to really push the envelope to make sure that those plans are realized and not just yet another plan put on the shelf and, and to kind of say that, you know, we tried um, to do something good, but, you know, it just wasn't in the cards. That's very specific. I'd uh, love to see how folks on, on the call within agencies can help to really establish and implement those um, plans that communities work so hard on. And I appreciate you saying that, Angela, because uh, four or five years ago when 617, 8617 was first passed, and this is a bill that requires agencies and communities to look at and solve local air pollution problems. And I remember um, back then you talking about, um, we have many uh, studies on shelves and plans on shelves. So I appreciate you bringing that up um, again and reminding us um, that it's an important tool and it can help. Um, Mustafa or Venice? Well, I think people just have to take ownership for and responsibility for what leadership means, right? Government is also about leadership. Um, and leadership is not followership. Leadership is leadership. Leadership is if you see that the system is broken, if you see that the system has created inequities again and again and again over generations, it's your job to challenge that and to, to come forward with a new way of delivering your mission, right? But leadership is not followership. Um, and, and, and I expect folks to, to own where we are at this moment of racial reckoning, of um, systemic racism, the relationship between air pollution and what COVID and the disproportionate impact of COVID on communities of color. There's some real work to be done here. And those of you in the air pollution regulatory space, there's some, there's some new history to be written and it can't be the stuff that we've been doing. And Mustafa, we're gonna give you the last word. I'll just leave you with the words of my grandmother. When you know better, do better. Do better. That's it. Thank you so much. I want to thank all three of you for coming and, and being a part of this today. Um, you all are thought leaders. Um, you've generated all, quite a lot. Again, I want to uh, remind people to take a look at the text box uh, or the chat box. Um, so thank you. And very sadly, I have to end this part of the conversation. Um, I uh, mentioned that I was going to hand it off to my colleague, Azabuke Akaba, but he's having some technical difficulties right now. So, Kevin, I am going to hand it back to you. Um, thank you very much. You're on mute, Kevin. That's 2021, right? That you're in front of a huge audience and you're still on mute. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you to the panelists for that incredible presentation um, and sharing your experiences and knowledge. You all have been national leaders and, and we're very lucky to, to share your insights and knowledge. And um, now it's my incredible pleasure to turn over for closing remarks to Charles Lee, who is the Senior Advisor for Environmental Justice at the United States Environmental Protection Agency. Charles has been a uh, colleague in the past and has always been a mentor and, and is one of the pioneers and real uh, early leaders of the environmental justice movement. So Charles, go ahead and take us home. Thank you, Kevin, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's good afternoon here, but it's good morning for you. Um, uh, 
I think um, uh, Kevin wanted me to um, uh, provide this set of remarks because, um, um, you know, I can provide, uh, and I hope to provide a, a sense of the arc of history that is now environmental justice. And as, uh, as uh, many of you know, when I first, and when, when many other people started to work on this issue, it didn't have a name. Um, so, you know, it harkens back, and this conversation harkens back to uh, the, um, uh, my landmark 1987 United Church of Christ study on toxic waste and race. And its key finding was that race was the most significant indicator for identifying locations of uh, hazardous uh, waste facilities in the United States. Um, and certainly over the last uh, 30, 40 years, you know, we've made a lot of progress, uh, but we still have a lot of work to do. And race still is the primary indicator in for uh, determining or uh, predicting uh, the quality, safety, and health of communities. And this is especially true um, in environmental justice where um, you know, the literature is uh, totally um, uh, clear that race is the singularly most important, most powerful factor in predicting areas of disproportionate environmental health impacts. Uh, so um, the, this conversation um, you know, uh, starts to get to not just the uh, what it is, but why it is. And the point has been made that uh, redlining uh, during the 1930s and many other uh, structural inequities in American society today is a result of conscious uh, governmental policy. Also, uh, this, this webinar is therefore important because it is a, a embrace of a, uh, as part of an intentional effort um, uh, on the part of federal, state, and local government agencies to acknowledge this history, um, to acknowledge the, the accountability that it places on us who work to, for, in government to address these wrongs, and a commitment to work together with all of you, um, uh, uh, among, among all of us, in an all-government approach, and with you. Um, and so today's uh, webinar uh, uh, is a call for action. Um, it is a call for all of you, uh, for you and your organizations to use your creativity, your deep commitment, and, and, uh, and take the risk to create a better future for all communities. Um, to carry out this call for action, I do want to point out uh, that there is a, a remarkable um, open embrace of concepts like systemic racism and the need to address them as part of the agenda uh, of governmental agencies, particularly at the, at the federal level that we have never seen before, that I, in all the years I have worked on this, have never seen before. Um, so, um, you know, we have things going on um, in um, the US EPA and across the federal government where uh, President Biden, Biden has, um, uh, has uh, called on us to make uh, uh, equity and environmental justice a central part of um, all of our work um, in EPA, uh, we have added a new um, uh, kind of uh, principle in terms of how we look at ourselves in terms of our mission, uh, in addition to sound science and, uh, and um, a rule of law and transparency, there is now equity and environmental justice. And this will be reflected in the, the strategic plans that are going to be uh, 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 that we're developing now and will be uh, coming forth with. Um, the, um, uh, across the federal government, President Biden has uh, called for a Justice 40 uh, initiative, which sets the goal of 40% uh, of all federal resources to benefit overburdened and dis disadvantaged communities. I do wanna say that this, is, uh, this idea uh, is informed in large measure by your experience, by your work and the experience in California. Um, and so um, opportunities, uh, so all that is to say opportunities to make progress today uh, exist in ways that none of us have seen in our lifetime. Um, we we uh, need to stand up to the challenge of taking full advantage of these opportunities. Um, but um, that is not something that is far removed from any of you because you've been part of shaping them. Um, nothing that I have described uh, could ever happen without the work over many decades of persons like you. In essence, we are moving forward 
um, uh, uh, our work moving forward will be based on the foundation you laid already. And thank you for being part of this conversation today. And we hope to work together on a set of issues that is truly important to the future of the nation. Kevin, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Charles. And I just wanted to thank everybody again for joining us. This is a long webinar, but this is an important conversation. And in order to listen to community leaders, we need to set aside the appropriate time to make sure this conversation was robust and meaningful. So I just wanted to, before I give uh, thank you to our presenters and support staff, let everybody know all of these presentations, the breakout sessions will be recorded and sent to everybody who registered for the event. So if you wanted to listen in in one, more than one room, you'll have that opportunity. Um, and with that, I wanted to just point out and, and thank the, all of the amazing speakers, um, many of whom are very busy people, for taking time out to share their lived experience, share their lessons learned, share what works and what we need to do in order to bring about real change. Um, it's an incredible honor to be able to have all of these people in one place. So we wanted to really show thank you to them. And I also wanted to thank all of the support staff, as you can tell, with 10 breakout rooms and all of these facilitators, there's a lot of work it took to make this happen. So thank you to all of the different state and local government leaders who help facilitate, as well as our uh, contract staff from MIG and uh, our language interpretation. So thank you all. Uh, hope you'll keep this conversation going. Remember that you have a role, you have personal agency, and there is a purpose behind the work that we're doing to create a better future for all. So thank you. <laughs>